welcome to the Dayton Art Institute's virtual Jefferson Patterson Society Reception. I am Stephen Allaire, the Chair of the Board of Trustees. On behalf of the entire board, thank you for your generous support of the DAI. Thank you for joining us to celebrate the opening of Changing Times Art of the 1960s. This exhibition is a DAI exclusive, which means it was curated and built from objects from more than 27,000 objects in the collection. It's exciting to see things many of us had never seen before. The exhibition runs through September 12th and will make for a great outing during the summer. I'm sorry that we cannot be together for our traditional JPS festivities due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The DAI team and board are working hard to keep you and our staff safe and healthy. Now, please join me in welcoming Michael Redinger, DAI Director and CEO. Thanks, Steve. And again, thank you to all of our JPS loyal members. I do hope that you've visited the museum since we reopened in March. We are currently open on Fridays and Saturdays from 11 to 5 and Sundays noon to 5. Many exciting things are continuing to happen behind the scenes, like the renovation of the galleries and more lighting being installed on the historic landscape of the hillside out front. Also, please continue to watch for more virtual programming being offered by our curatorial and education teams who are doing a great job providing that content. Museum guides are creating wonderful objects of the month videos and art vids for kids that I learn something new about every time I watch them about the collection. We continue our great partnership with Dayton Metro Library on the Reimagining Works project that brings commissioned art to all the libraries inspired by the DAI's own collection. We wanna make a special welcome to the new Dayton Metro Library director, Jeffrey Trezak. The new West Branch Library is due to open in the fall of 2021. Commissions were awarded to James Pate, Cedric Michael Cox, Kevin Harris, Susan Burns working with Rodney Veal and Brianna Rhodes, and Bing Davis working with his son, Derek Davis. Cedric Cox is a Cincinnati-based artist, and all of the others are Dayton-based artists. These artists responded to the DAI Inspiration Works Cantata by Norman Lewis and the Burkina Faso Mask by the Biwa people. Artwork was also chosen for the Burkhart Branch Library due to open in January of 2022. Commissions were awarded to Carrie Longley, Deborah Dixon, Tracy Longley Cook, and the Inside Out Studio. Artists responded to three inspiration pieces, Joy of the Waters by Harriet Frischmuth, Flying Pup King by Yoshitomo Nara, and Vanduras de Frutas by Alfredo Martinez. The artists were all new to the project. Thank you to our Board of Trustees and Associate Board who have been so supportive during the pandemic. Also, thank you to our incredible staff and museum guides who helped to make our special exhibitions so wonderful. They have been so resilient and I am so proud to work with all of them. We welcome and thank our new JPS members, Danielle and Terrence Wright, Danielle is a new board member and we are so excited to have her as part of the DAI family. A big thank you to our sponsors of Changing Times Art of the 1960s, which include benefactor sponsor, Premier Health, patron sponsors, Norma Landis and Rick Hoffman, and supporting sponsors, Linda Black Keurig Family Foundation, our supporting media sponsor, Think TV, and we always want to thank our special sponsors, Ohio Arts Council, Montgomery County Arts and Cultural District, and Culture Works. And a special thanks to the Ohio Citizens for the Arts for their continued art advocacy on behalf of all of the arts in Ohio. Finally, as you know, 2020 was an extremely difficult year. Thanks to your membership of JPS, government, federal, state, Montgomery County, and city of Dayton funding, our sponsors and the hard work of our development team, we were able to balance our budget. All that said, we are predicting that this year is going to be even more challenging as we come out of the pandemic crisis. Membership is down 20%. So now more than ever, it is a great time to help us recruit new JPS members and new members in general, and to give the gift of membership. Membership makes a wonderful birthday, anniversary, or thank you gift, and is perfect for those graduates that are staying local. 
I also hope you will participate in Backyard Art Ball and support our annual fund. The funds raised are vital to us continuing our mission of the Dayton Art Institute being committed to enriching the community by creating meaningful experiences with art that are available to all. The Signature Events team and many others in the Associate Board are working hard at planning on and going forward with a DAI traditional Oktoberfest on the grounds while continuing to follow whatever the CDC, State of Ohio, Montgomery County, and City of Dayton guidelines are at the end of September. Now please join me in welcoming Dr. Jerry Smith, Chief Curator and Director of Education, who curated Changing Times Art of the 1960s, all while working with the curatorial team to continue to make beautiful renovations to the museum galleries. We are so fortunate to have Jerry here at the DAI. He is approachable, creative, smart, and has an amazing work ethic. Thank you, Jerry. Please grab a snack and a beverage and sit back and relax and enjoy a virtual visit of Changing Times Art of the 1960s. Thank you for joining us today as we take a look at the DAI's latest special exhibition, Changing Times, Art of the 1960s. This exhibition features works created during that tumultuous decade, and it highlights significant movements uh, that we find in the art from this era. We have pop art, neo-dada, we have explorations in abstraction and figurative abstraction. We have color field painting, as well as examples of op art, minimalism, and conceptual art. Included in the exhibition are paintings, prints, photographs, and sculpture, all of it drawn from the Dayton Art Institute's own collection, which has deep holdings in art of this era. In the 1960s, the school of the Dayton Art Institute was still active and the museum was actively collecting contemporary art from that time. Of the more than 80 works on view in the exhibition, half of these were collected in the decade they were made. It's a look also then at the art that was meaningful to Dayton at that time as well. In the exhibition, you will see examples of recognizable artists, figures who are major names in 20th century art, like Andy Warhol, Roy Lichtenstein, Mark Rothko, and Saul Lewitt. As well as, you'll encounter works by artists that are likely unfamiliar to you. Uh, but still extremely talented. The exhibition further explores works by regional artists, several artists who are from Ohio. And while this exhibition is made up of works by American artists predominantly, there are a few examples of international art as well. Now, let's take a look at some of the work you will see in the exhibition. I mentioned Andy Warhol already, so that's a good place to start. And we're fortunate to own a work created by Warhol in 1962, his number one printed $2 bill. It is a screen print made in the year that Warhol first turned to screen print as his primary means of art creation. 1962 was also the year that he began many of his most popular themes, Campbell soup cans, uh, Coca-Cola bottles, Marilyn Monroe. And one of his Marilyns from a 1967 print is in the exhibition. And his, of course, images of American currency. Pop artists, they explored consumer culture in their work and Warhol embraced the business side of art making. As he said, being good in business is the most fascinating kind of art. Making money is art and working is art and good business is the best art. Ed Ruscha, 
another pop artist working in California, uh, created books that spoke to popular culture. We have two in the exhibition, 26 Gasoline Stations from 1963 and Every Building on Sunset Strip, 1966. These are like visual travelogues uh, in which we see photographs Unsum, unsentimental, uh, banal even. Uh, he was living in California and he made many road trips to Oklahoma where he used to live. And he took photographs of the gas stations that he visited along the way. Uh, and then put them in a book that read like his travel from west to east. At the time it was published, it was done when art books were fancy and uh, photography, especially landscape photography, was often pretty, especially in comparison to this unsentimental approach. And people were quite confused, didn't quite know what to do with these at the time. Um, the books, however, are a key example of not only pop art, but conceptual art for its unsentimentality that challenged those traditions. Likewise, every building on Sunset Strip ex is exactly that, a string of photographs of the buildings on both sides of the popular street in West Hollywood, and the book stretches out accordion-like, uh, allowing you to see those images strung together as if you were traveling down the road. Now, the 1950s, the decade prior, was a period in which abstract expressionism, or action paintings, had reigned with critics and collectors, and the pop art styles of the 1960s went against the individuality of that movement. Also going against the ideas found in abstract expressionism can be found in artists who were exploring figurative uh, work. The human figure played a major role, uh, or played a minor role, in abstract expressionism, yet figurative art made a strong return in the 1960s. You can see that in the art of Jay Milder. He felt so out of place up against the continuing influence of abstract expressionism, as well as the cool styles of pop art and minimalism, that he formed a group of artists called Rhino Horn to promote figural painting. We also see the figure in photography as photographers recorded the events of the time. Mark Rubaud's Peace March, Washington, D.C. from 1967 pictures a 17-year-old Jan Rose Kazmir holding a chrysanthemum in front of a row of National Guard soldiers. At the time, she was unaware the photograph was being taken, but as she notes, it's been repeated, it's been reprinted frequently since, and it's a powerful representation of courage during peaceful protests. There are plenty of artists who continued to explore means of abstraction championed in early, earlier eras. George Morrison, for example, was from the first generation of abstract expressionists who kept exploring ideas with color and design. His composition in painting, March 10th, 1960, for example, he used thickly applied uh, swatches of paint to make a textured, energetic composition. Likewise, we have Joan Mitchell's Untitled uh, from 1961, one of the highlights of the museum's collection. We see the creative process played out in the canvas as Mitchell looked to nature for inspiration. And we have another way of responding to nature in the exhibition nearby. In Kimber Smith's The Sunflower, 1964, this large work is simplified. It strips things down to basic forms. It's based on nature, but it does not try to replicate nature. The bold orange design shows the interest in color for many artists, including those who work in color field and minimalist compositions. 
Mark Rothko, one of the best known artists of the 20th century, created images of loose rectangular forms that float above fields of color. While he often worked on a large scale, his untitled Green Blue on Blue from 1967 is a small oil on paper and a wonderful example of color field painting. As he claimed, we favor the simple expression of complex thought. The minimalists took things even further in the 1960s, making paintings that were among the, about the flat surface, often featuring only a single color. Ludwig Sanders' painting from 1966 is a nice example of direct use of color and minimal use of line to create a composition. In many ways, it is what we, the viewers, bring to the art that make it complete. This can be found in art of conceptual art as well, which is often about the mental process of the viewer to finish the work, the visual representation often taking a backseat to the idea. And one of the pioneers of this movement was Saul Lewitt. Here is one of his wall drawings, which is a concept by the artist. In this instance, four basic patterns that are varied and repeated throughout the design, imagined as being then replicated on a large scale to fill a wall, which could be completed by others. The idea is what's important about the art. These are just some of the things you will see in this exhibition. I hope you come in and enjoy it. Please check out our website at DaytonArtInstitute.org for related programming, including a collection of music selected from the 1960s that is presented on Spotify. Thank you for your support, and I do hope you enjoy the exhibition. Oh,